بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم It is not a problem of Jew versus Muslim not at all Jewish people lived in that land freely brethren with their Muslims friendly neighbors everybody knows this what happened very briefly and I want our youngsters especially to study more I gave a lecture in more detail it's called 1914 and the making of the Muslim world okay I want you to listen to that lecture I gave it uh, in 2014 in the 100th anniversary of 1914 I want you to listen to that lecture and and listen to in detail about the setting up of how Jerusalem took place so we said two things I want you to number one theologically aqidah wise Jerusalem is holy for us number two one of the reasons why our heart is so much in pain is because of the sheer brutality and the inhumanity of how this land was taken from the original people and handed over to another civilization. Such blatant political maneuvering, we haven't seen it in the 20th century as what happened in Palestine. In 1897, a group of rich and powerful people of Jewish origin and background in Europe decided that they wanted to make Jerusalem into a majority Jewish territory. In 1897, Jerusalem had 3% Jewish population and around 85 to 87% Muslim population and the rest Christian. 3% were Jewish people, the original Jews of that land from many centuries. A hundred years later, 75% of that region is Jewish. Think about that one statistic. In 1897, 3%. In 1997, 75%. What happened? The political colonialist powers, and in particular, the biggest criminal in this issue is the United Kingdom. What they did, and the Balfour Declaration, and the false promises, and the conniving, and the backstabbing that they did during World War I. The United Kingdom, England, in particular what it did, it promised the same land to three different people. The same land, and they knew they're doing this. But seek, they promised it to the Arabs, they promised it to the Ottoman, they pro and secretly they promised it as well to European Jewry. Now what right does England have to bargain with Palestine? And what is going to happen to the people living in Palestine? This is why, dear young men and women, I want you to understand this point. When people, when Muslims say, we do not accept the legitimacy of the country of Israel, it's not because we're against the people or the religion. It's because of the mechanism of how this took place. It's because the people were forcibly removed. It's because people who didn't own the land decided who should get the land. A third party, Europe, is deciding that this land should be given to European Jews. What has that got to do with the people living? What right do Europe have? What right does England have to do this? Nobody asked the people living in that land for thousands of years. So what happened? Slowly but surely, from 1897 up until the 1920s and 30s, European Judaism began spend sending money and purchasing and intimidating and many mobs and whatnot took place. Obviously, World War II exacerbated the situation because of the horrific tragedies of Hitler. And this is a very important point. Muslims, Hitler was an evil person. We don't support Hitler. Hitler was an evil person. And what he did, and I say this publicly, even today I will say this. If we were alive in Europe when Hitler was doing what he was doing, I would hope that I would be of the people who are helping those that are persecuted against the persecutors. If you know the reality of that person and what he was doing, they were not guilty of any crime that deserved that type of death. Our anger is not towards the people, it is towards the policies. We are not anti-Jewish, we are anti-Zionist. I want you all to memorize this point. Zionism is the political movement that asks or that claims that that region only belongs to fellow Zionists. We are against that. This is a type of apartheid. Apartheid. It's literally apartheid because it's like saying the white people belong to America and the Native Indians have nothing to do with this. This is racism. It's like saying South Africa, which was an apartheid country. When the Europeans, the white Europeans came, they said, we own this land. You blacks have no right to be here. This is blatant racism. 
And this is the reality of Israel. It is the only apartheid country that is still operating today. I'm not saying this. Our president, Jimmy Carter, says this. Quote Jimmy Carter, don't quote yourself. Tell your opponents, tell the people, hey, this is the United Nations. This is Jimmy Carter has said that it is an apartheid country. Nelson Mandela. If anybody knows what apartheid it is in Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela said that the Palestinian people are facing a struggle in some ways even worse than the black South Africans. That is coming from Nelson Mandela. What more do you want? This isn't me. This isn't a religious fanatic. This isn't. No, neutral people are telling you that this is a humanitarian crisis. You have killed and massacred and forcibly removed millions of people in the first Nakba and the second Nakba. I don't have time to get into this. In 1947, in 1963, you forcibly removed millions of people. And because of that, Palestinians are all over the world. They were kicked out of their land. And those that didn't go, you threw them in concentration camps that is called Gaza. President Jimmy Carter says that Gaza and the occupied territories are the largest open air prisons in the world. This is our president who's a fundamentalist Christian, he's not a Muslim. And he calls it the largest open air prisons in the world. And then you expect nothing to happen and you expect that they're just gonna stay there. You've taken every hope and every opportunity away. They cannot live normal lives. And now what we are seeing in the Jarrah neighborhood and district is blatant colonization. The videos are there. And actually, wallahi, we thank Allah for this modern technology. All of this used to happen and we didn't have modern technology. We weren't able to verify. Now you have live video footage. A settler comes in from Brooklyn, New York. He's from Brooklyn. And he gets a free passport to go and live. And somebody who's been there for 2,000 years because they're Muslims, they're the descendants of the Canaanites, some of them. And others of them are locals. These are people, ethnically, they are the people of the soil for 2,000 years. And somebody from Brooklyn comes in and he says, I have the right to overtake this land. Who are you? God gave me this land. Literally barges in and tells the family, get out of here. And the Supreme Court of that country has sided with, obviously, the settlers coming from this region and saying, you have no right to this land. We don't expect any freedom or justice from them. So the reason why we are so angry is the blatant double standards. This is not a... And by the way, this is one of the tactics that is used by the, uh, by the other side. They say it's a very complicated situation. You'll never understand it. No, Wallahi, it is as clear as the light of day. It is as simple. It's not complicated at all. It is colonialism in its most brutal and raw forms. A third party comes in and they decide who gets what. And you know, I'm going to tell you a personal anecdote and then I'll hand it over to Ustad. More than a decade ago, what year is it now? It's 2021. In, tw in 2010. I was selected to go with a group of American Imams to visit Auschwitz and Dachau, the concentration camps. This is a New York Times article, you read about that, they have pictures and interviews of me. And because it was an official delegation, you know, we met some amazing people and we had with us the representative of the State Department who is in charge of anti-Semitism. The State Department has an official representative for the world in charge of anti-Semitism. By the way, there's no such office for Islamophobia. No such thing. Anyway, she was with us in this. And we were having many, many deep discussions. And one of the issues she said is that any person who doesn't agree with the legitimacy of the country of Israel is an anti-Semite. He hates Jewish people. And we're having breakfast. I said, no, hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. You can't say that. You cannot say that. Disputing the legitimacy of Israel is a historical and a political issue. Don't bring in anti-Semitism. Don't cry wolf here. And I said to her, if a Native American that you put up in a reservation camp somewhere in Wyoming or somewhere in North Dakota, if a Native American said, hey, Columbus shouldn't have come here. What you guys did was a massacre. You took our land. You took our freedom. You threw us in a concentration camp. Would you say he's anti-white? Would you say he's a racist? And she was silent at this. Legally, by the way, and this is a problem in our country, American law says, if you criticize the creation of Israel, you are an anti-Semite. And I challenged her, I said, you're heading in the wrong direction. And you're gonna make the situation worse. This is not the way forward. 
and other conversations of this nature you have to understand wallahi we have a, a major problem in terms of the politics and whatnot in any case to summarize and then how we're to stop the first point as i said theologically Baytul Maqdis and Jerusalem they are a part of our communal heritage it is Quranic it is from the Sunnah it is from the Seerah and then secondly historically what makes us so frustrated and angry is the blatant colonization of this country how it was done how the fact that you didn't care about all of these people massacres took place when the first Jews arrived and especially when Israel was, was created in 1948 massacres hundreds of innocent villagers there is photographic evidence and grainy video footage the Deir Yassin massacre which every Palestinian is aware of they filled up a well with hundreds of women and children hundreds they killed an entire town people fled for their lives and then you're gonna say oh the land was free the land was open no you killed you intimidated you kicked out you took over by force you threw everybody in a concentration camp and you literally barged in not caring about the repercussions thinking God was on your side and we say to them no Allah never allows this type of injustice Allah never allows this type of dhulm and we say to the people who have an ounce of iman amongst them that if you truly believe in God then God is watching and God shall judge and the cry of the innocent and the cry of the victim and the cry of the women and children you have killed will not go unanswered Allah does not allow the tyrant to flourish and we tell them as well look to history when we ruled there was never any political and religious problem Christian Muslim Jews all lived together all of this came as a result of Zionism so to conclude Muslims we are not anti-Jewish we are not anti-Semitic we are anti Zionist and our criticism is to Zionism and our anger is to Zionism because it is a racist methodology it is the only remnants of apartheid that is still being practiced and this is something that is well known to all and with that inshallah I'll hand it over to Ustad Murad let's have him and then shall do the question you have them بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين <تصفيق> الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين جزاكم الله خير first of all for coming out and uh, it really reflects how much you care about this great and noble cause that belongs to the whole Ummah of Islam and not only to the Palestinian people for those of you that do not know I am a Palestinian American and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with the ability to live or the opportunity to live and experience Palestine firsthand. In 1995, my father made the toughest decision in his life. On the Sheikh, he, made, he did the history side and the political side. I'm going to share my personal experience in Palestine. In 1995, my father made the hardest decision in his life by sending me my siblings and my mother over to Palestine. Me being a nine-year-old didn't know what to expect. Obviously coming from America, I had role models, but they were basketball players, maybe singers, maybe actors. But when I went there, everything changed from top to bottom. The first day in my house in Palestine, the first day in my house, my father, alhamdulillah, built us a new house in our village on our land. The first day, or the, it was the second night, at 2 a.m., six Israeli soldiers barged into our house. And they walked in. My mom wasn't even wearing hijab. They woke us all up and I'm sharing my own experience. This is something I lived myself, and I'm, I never shared to anyone. It's only because of this that I'm sharing this. I tell people personally, but I don't tell people in large gatherings. So this is the first time I'm sharing this. I woke up, imagine the second night, in our new house, with a soldier pointing his M16 in my face, and then telling me to get up and emptying my closet clothes on, 
on top of me and my brother and seeing my mother scrambling to wear her hijab. I knew the struggle is real when that happened. I knew something was different. But I started to wonder why I was here. As I was a child, my father, my mother always instilled the Palestinian cause in me. Told me, Mama, Baba, this is your cause. Palestine, this is our land, this is the land of the Muslimin. Do not ever forget it. Just because you were born in America, does it mean it doesn't belong to you? This is for all of the Muslimin. And this is the land of your forefathers. And all of your grandparents are buried there in the village and I can show you every single one of their graves. And I knew this. But I didn't understand yet as I was still a little kid. I was about 10, 11 years old. What can I possibly understand? Every day, I would hear Apache helicopters on top of me. Every day, every day we would stop at checkpoints to be searched randomly. Every day, imagine going to school, having to travel 40 minutes to go to a decent school, and some days risking being, st being stopped and returned walking as a 10-year-old, walking miles back home. And as a 10-year-old, and my, my father doesn't, probably doesn't even know this. I never told him this, you know, but he's gonna find, if he's here, he's going to find out today. At times, we were even shot at and we had to hide. We had to duck and hide behind fences and, 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 and walls and stuff. Subhanallah. As a child, we saw our friends being injured. One of my friends shot in his leg and permanently disabled. One of my best friends. Another one of my good friends, his... He was shot in his stomach and his guts spilled out on the street. You know, as a child, this is a normal experience for a Palestinian. And mind you, I'm an American. I didn't live my whole life there. All I lived was five years. But those five years were enough to show me what the struggle is about in Palestine. Receiving an education there, alhamdulillah, things were fine, but I still didn't understand what it was like why we were going through this? Why my father left, he sent us from America back to Palestine? As I understood this is the land of our forefathers, but the struggle risking our lives day to day was something that was still on my mind all the time. Imagine this as a 10, 11 year old. But when I lived there, I realized that the land is something that is different. It's unlike any land in the world. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Qur'an that I studied there as well. In the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ وَلُوطًا إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا لِلْعَالَمِينَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Abraham and Lot to the land that Allah blessed for everyone, the alameen. In the more, uh, every day, what do we recite? The first ayah in the Qur'an after Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is what? Alhamdu. Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. But there's a land for these Alameen, the people as well. The Lord of mankind. This is the land that Allah blessed for everyone. So it's not only for Muslims, it's for everyone. It's blessed for everyone. It's blessed for everyone, which is, which is what makes it special. In the Quran, I would read Jannatin min Nakhilin wa A'nab. How many times was Nakhilin wa A'nab mentioned? In Saudi Arabia, we saw nakhil, we saw date trees. But we never saw, like, I, I rarely saw grape trees. But in Palestine, that's everywhere. Everywhere you go, there are date trees and, and grape trees. And there are fig trees and olive trees. Anywhere you go in Palestine. And these are the holy and blessed trees that Allah mentioned in the Qur'an. I never understood why Allah gave the example of His own light with the olive tree. The tree that is the most planted tree in Palestine. And why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swore by Palestine when he said, Wattini was zaytun in Surah at -teen. I knew there was something different about this land. I remember my mom used to tell me, Go and plant, help me plant the garden in front of the house. Wallahi, we would get any seed from anywhere, we'd get seeds from Guatemala. We'd get seeds from Chile, from China, from Japan. We throw it in this land and wallahi, it would grow and produce the same exact fruit. 
Anything we planted, Allahu Akbar, it would grow. I knew, then I started to realize there is something different here. The people, I didn't understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this land and attributed barakah to it. And the Prophet ﷺ in the authentic sunnah said that it is the best of Allah's land and to it Allah sends the best of His creation. يَجْتَبِي إِلَيْهَا خِيرَتُهُ مِنْ خَلْقِهِ and in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, there would always be a group on the haqq that will prevail until the day of judgment. And he said this, like Shaykh Yasir mentioned before, before the Quds was even for the Muslimin. So meaning, at the time, there were Christians that were upon the haqq. So the Prophet ﷺ said, there will be a group of people on the haqq in this land. In Al Bayt Al Maqdis wa Kinafi Bayt Al Maqdis, in the Quds and around the Quds until the Day of Judgment. So, if you're looking for the truth, if you're looking for a group on the Haqq, then the Quds and around the Quds is what we look for. This is what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. The people are something different, wallahi. In Palestine, I met mothers that lost one, two, and three children, and wallahi, didn't say anything but Allahu Akbar. And said, Alhamdulillah, that my son is a shaheed. Alhamdulillah, that my son is a We used to read about this. We read the Sahabiyat. But we saw this with our own eyes. In Palestine, I saw a relative, there's a relative of mine, who was in prison with a very high sentence. Many, many life sentences by this apartheid occupation. Wallahi, when they came and told him, we want to exchange you as part of a group that we are releasing. But you have to leave Palestine and live somewhere else in another country. And there are many countries that agreed to accept you. He said, he said, if I refuse to leave, how many will you release instead of me? Can you calculate all of my sentences and put together, release that amount of people? They came back to him. After a while, and they said, we'll release 200. He said, I'd rather make 200 mothers happy than one mother. Let them go. And he remained in prison. Allahu Akbar. This is amazing. In Palestine, there are people, subhanAllah, what is, what is the main source of income for many people in Palestine? Olive trees, zayt zaytun, olive oil, and olive sales, right? They export it, the best olive oil in the world, subhanAllah. That is the pride of every Palestinian. You know, when I was a child, within the first year of living there, I saw 120 trees of my grandfathers that we inherited for centuries. It was ours for centuries. SubhanAllah, they were uprooted in front of my eyes as a child. Look at the trauma. These, there was, a, there was a Palestinian farmer who was heading home and he had 50 tanks of oil which will take him months to pick the olives for, subhanAllah, 50 tanks of oil. He had them on a truck, he was happy that Allah gave him the rizq for the rest of the year, alhamdulillah. On his way he stopped at one of the checkpoints, the many checkpoints that the occupation has and they make sure to make an example of anyone they can. They always want to break us. That is their sole purpose there. They, they just want to break the, the willpower of the Palestinians. This brother, this farmer, they told him, come. We are not going to let you go on. They let him stay. Our Two hours, three hours. He's like, Jama'a, come on, let me go. I have to go home. I have things to do. They're like, if you curse at your religion, and you curse at Palestine, and you curse at your prophet, we will let you go. And you can take your oil and go. He said, La Wallah. I'll never do it. So, they said, we're going to pour your oil, we'll spill it on the streets. They started to spill one at a time. They told him, did you change your mind yet? He said, la wallah. 
And people are passing the checkpoint. People that perhaps know him from his village, from his town. And this is from the villages around Al-Quds. Just to let you know what type of people they are. They were leaving. And they saw him with his oil being spilled. And the word spread in the village. Subhanallah. Everyone knew what he was going through. He kept saying no until all 50 tanks, all 50 tins of oil were spilled. His rizq for a whole year was gone. They told him, they gave him a beating and they told him go home. He went home and in his village he found 50 tins in front of his house. Allah. All the people, alhamdulillah, they came together and they chipped in to give him back his rizq. Subhanallah. This is the type of people we're talking about. When the Prophet ﷺ said, You find a type of people that you won't find around. And this is not for any reason, but because Allah knows who to choose for this noble cause. The people defending Al-Aqsa right now, ya ikhwan, are the people that Allah chose to be in Al-Aqsa. The people that were chosen from all over the world, that have the hearts and the willpower, the irada, the determination to defend this masjid, that is a right upon all of us. They have a right upon all of us to defend it as well. But Allah chose them. And the least we could do is try to help them with dua. And the least we could do is try to think of ways to help them. The people are struggling, ya ikhwan. The people are going through a lot. These people that you see throwing rocks and throwing, uh, trying to defend Masjid Al-Aqsa with whatever they have are people that shared the same experience as me and even more. Allahu Akbar. Guys, you know when I want Shaykh Yasser, Allah, look, um, and we're talking as what? Well, we're Americans here. I thought because I was an American, I'd be treated differently. And I remember when that, that was tarnished at my first checkpoint. When they were, when an American told them, hey, I'm an American, you know, don't you have to let me go through this checkpoint? They would take the passport, spit in it, and give it back. They're like, let your president help you. This is the type of people, this is the arrogance that we're talking about. Imagine, America means nothing to them. And I remember, wallah, my, our flight, Sheikh, for my mom, myself, my brother, my two sisters, five tickets that we booked from the airport in Al-Lud. Al-Lud is a city 10 minutes away from my village. So we are like Abab Al-Lud, my village. So, 10 minutes away from the airport, we weren't allowed to enter the airport. Why? They said, we just decided not to let you in. Like we booked flights for $4,000. That was a lot of money. This was in the 90s, right? $4,000. They said, we, don't, we can't let you in. So my mom called the consulate in, in the Quds. She said, I need to talk to the, to the consulate. I need to talk to somebody. And the consular himself said, come in, my fellow citizens. Right? We sit down in the office and we tell him what we're going through. And he was automatically struck with fear. And you could, we could see it. And I was, a, maybe I was a young boy at the time. I was a teenager. He said, he shut the door. He got up before he answered. He's like, guys, you know, anywhere in the world, we'll help you, inshallah. Anywhere. But here, they do whatever they want. They do anything. And that's the moment I'm like, yo, this place, khalas. This place. Yani, these people, they reach the peak of arrogance. And this is why Allah cursed them in the Quran. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran that He will send to them who will punish them until the day of judgment. They will always be in dhil and saghar until the day of judgment. These sahayna, these Zionists. This apartheid regime, ya ikhwan, is a regime of occupation, is a regime that doesn't deserve respect because it, it respects no one else. And the only thing, the least we can do is reciprocate the same hatred and animosity that they have for us and for the rest of humanity. Don't think because we're Muslim, they hate us. No, they hate everyone equally, these people. They're arrogant. وَيَسْعَوْنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَسَادَ And they cause corruption wherever they go. 
Historically, like Sheikh Yasser mentioned before, and I'll end with this. Historically, this land was for the believers. And it remained for the believers. And it will continue to be promised for the believers. The people of Moses, they were sieved and filtered with the nahar of Talut. You know, like Shaykh Uthaymeen rahimahullah said, there were 70,000, 76,000 people that approached the valley, that approached the river, and they weren't able to cross because they disobeyed the leader Talut in entering this holy land. And only 4,000 were able to enter. And the rest, the 72,000 were back, according to some narrations. 4,000 entered. And from the 4,000, they said, we cannot, قوم Jabbarin, these people are too strong for us. We cannot enter. And then from them, God knows how many thousand entered. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory. And this land was written for the believers. Until Isa alayhi salam came with the Bible. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of their killing of the prophets and messengers, and them disobeying and dis, uh, disbelieving in the Bible, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, Ma'asalat. Khalas. This land is not for you. It's for Bani Israel, but the ones who believed in Jesus. Because there were Bani Israel that believed in Jesus. Right? Alayhi salatu salam. Right? Bani Israel are still in Palestine till today, Ikhwan. And these Bani Israel who believed in Jesus remain there because they are believers and they're deservant of it. And when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came, they gave him they gave Umar ibn Khattab the key because they knew this land is for the believers and for the followers of the prophets. So when Muhammad sallallahu came with the message, they gave him the key and they all believed. Alhamdulillah. Right now only 2% of Palestine is Christian. The rest believed in the message of Islam. And these are from Bani Israel as well. They're a mix. Bani Kanaan, the Philistines, Bani Israel. There's no doubt they're a mix of different Iraq. But what we say is, that the rightful people of this land never left it to begin with. The rightful people of this land, they never left it. So it's of utmost oppression and misrepresentation of history to say that the people that deserve it left and lived outside. No, the people that deserved it stayed in it and never left it to begin with. Alhamdulillah. Barakallah fikum. And with this inshallah, I just want to say, because this was primarily a youth event, I think every parent should get their children together, get their nieces and nephews together, and have a real meaningful conversation about this. Tell them what this struggle is about. Everything you heard today from Dr. Yasser and myself, tell them what it's about. Tell them that they as Muslims have a responsibility in front of Allah. They have a responsibility in front of Allah. And we should never let this go. We're accountable, ya khwan. If we don't make dua, if we don't try and help, if we don't attempt, then we... What do we have in front of Allah? If you're a student in university, and someone in your history class says something about, oh, anti-Semitism, no, raise your hand, defend the cause. You have the knowledge. Listen to the lectures. Sheikh Yasser has plenty of lectures. There are plenty of lectures online. Listen to them, be equipped. Don't ever be a silent devil in class, whether in high school or in college. Organize an MSA event. Organize another event, start a club, do some sort of an awareness program. Make this the spark of an uh, international effort to raise awareness of this hypocrisy that we see. Subhanallah. Every country is allowed, every country has borders that they can't cross except for Israel. Sahir? Subhanallah. Fa expose this hypocrisy, be an advocate of truth. And do not ever stay silent because that is like the example of a shaytan and akhras, a silent or a, a mute devil. We seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's refuge from that. Jazakumullah khair for listening and forgive me for prolonging this shit. Jazakumullah khair. We'll finish here. I know people have questions. We're going to sh shut off here. But two things, please. Write this down, especially our young men and women. Firstly, the best documentary that is for by non-Muslims and it's really good, it's on YouTube for free, Occupation 101. It's a really good documentary. Please watch it. 
and it's done by non-Muslims and it's a really, you can show it to anybody with zero background and they'll understand what's going on. Occupation 101. Also another website by a Christian American lady who went as the Zionist and when she saw what's going on, she flipped completely and she is now one of the most anti-Zionist. She's still a Christian, Caucasian lady. She went there, she just couldn't, she couldn't believe what she's seeing. So she started campaigning for the last 25, 30 years and she has a website, please write this down. If Americans knew dot org. If Americans knew dot org. Her thesis is very simple. If you knew what's going on, you would not be supporters of that country. So please log on to this website and then uh, use it for your friends. Jazakumullahu khairan. If you have any question, you can come up to me privately. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.